It is not a new record. It, it's my New Year's resolution. How about that? So. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year as well. Good to see everyone back uh, as we begin this new year. And I hope you had a, a festive holiday, a chance to relax with your families. Uh, I will be prepared to answer your questions on a range of topics in, in just a moment. But I uh, want to begin, first of all, with an important update on the situation regarding the California National Guard uh, bonus issue. As you recall, Secretary Carter directed back in October to suspend all efforts to recoup money from members of the California National Guard based on eligibility issues to receive bonus payments for their service several years ago. He also asked the department to come up with a streamlined, centralized process to ensure the fair and equitable treatment of our service members and the rapid resolution of cases by January 1st. That task uh, fell to Peter Levine, who is performing the duties of acting undersecretary for personnel and readiness and his team, and they have met, in fact, the secretary's deadline and have developed uh, a process to move forward. And I've asked Peter to come here to spell it out for everyone. And again, he will walk through it, be able to take your questions on that topic, and then I'll step back in and uh, take your questions on other topics. So without any further ado, Peter Levine, welcome. Thank you. So I don't know whether anybody here is interested in good news stories, but the Secretary did, in his October 26th announcement, uh, direct the suspension of all efforts to correct erroneous bonuses from California National Guard soldiers, and he directed that by January 1st we would establish a streamlined, centralized process to ensure the fair and equitable treatment of our service members in the rapid resolution of cases. It being now after January 1st, um, Peter thought it would be good to provide you with an update, and, and, and the basic bottom line of the update is that we are on track to meet all these objectives. The process is in place. We believe that we can complete all these cases well before the, the uh, July 1st deadline established by the Secretary. The bottom line is that uh, we have about 17,500 California uh, National Guard soldiers who are facing potential recoupment. Um, we uh, expect to initiate a detailed review by the Army Board for the Correction of Military Records for only uh, for several hundred cases, less, probably less, less than a thousand cases. The majority of those, the vast majority of those 17,000 cases we will be able to screen out um, and forgive debts or forgo debt collection without the need for more detailed review by the, by the BCMR. Um, so in the course of the next month, we will be we will begin. It will be notifying people on a rolling basis, but we will begin notifying uh, soldiers over the next uh, over the next month um, that they are that their their cases have been dismissed. That they they will not be uh, there will not be any recoupment in their in their cases. Um, I'd like to just frame the issue briefly um, because. Uh, um, Recoupment is a fact of life in the military, and recoupment sounds bad in this context because the specific cases that have been publicized are bad, um, but recoupment is a fact of life. We're, the Army is recouping, has, has, any, has about 100,000 recoupment actions ongoing at any given time. Um, sometimes the member makes a mistake, sometimes the, the, uh, the service does. Um, the classic case of recoupment is somebody gets a military education and has a or a military training or something that carries a service commitment with it. They don't fulfill the service commitment, and we expect them to pay the money back. We don't give somebody a free education; uh, we give them a free education in exchange for a service commitment, and um, and that's that's part of the bargain. The cases in California are different for several reasons. One is that the um, many of these service members fulfilled their obligation. The error was an error on, on, on the part of the government as to whether they were eligible. Um, they may have been misled as to whether they were eligible. And then the final, the final touch is that because California National Guard went back and looked at these cases several years removed from when the error was made, they were in many cases recouping from members who had fulfilled their service, com for service commitment. So they'd gotten a bonus in exchange for a service commitment, then they fulfilled the service commitment they served, they may have even been deployed, and then we came back and said, by the way, you are ineligible, we're taking your money back. That's what makes those cases unfair, not the fact that it's recoupment. There's nothing wrong with recoupment in general, but in these cases, uh, we had a number of cases that were really very problematic. Um, but all recoupment cases are not alike, and that's why we felt we had the obligation to go through and look at these cases individually so we could determine whether recoupment was, in fact, justified. So since the Secretary's October announcement, um, I've been working closely with uh, the National Guard Bureau, the Army, Army Audit Agency, the, uh, the um, 
Army Review Board's agency and the Defense Finance and Accounting Service um, to set up a process so we can go through these cases. It's basically what we're working is a two-step process. One where we, we, we screen the cases um, to determine whether we can, we can essentially say uh, we don't need further information, this, we don't need to seek a debt, we, we don't need to collect a debt in this, in this case. And then the hard cases which will then be put before the Army Board for Correction of Military Records for individualized review uh, where the individuals will, will have an opportunity to make their case. Um, we begin with, as I said, about 17,500 cases. We put those cases into two categories. There are about 1,400 where the California National Guard already established a debt and referred them to DFAS for recruitment. The, the remaining 16,000, the California National Guard uh, flagged for review um, and, and notified soldiers in many cases of the potential that they would, they would be facing a debt collection but didn't take further action. So those 16,000, essentially the sword of Damocles is, whole, is, is hanging over the soldiers, uh, but debt collection hadn't been started. We have different legal processes we have to follow uh, if debt collection has actually been started, if the debt has been established. So we review the 1,400 a little bit differently from, from the, from the, uh, from the 16,000. The 1,400, um, the Army Audit Agency and the Army Review Board's agency have already gone through and reviewed those cases, and, 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 and I would say um, we all owe them a thanks because while we were all home over the holidays enjoying ourselves, they were here reviewing uh, California National Guard cases. Um, they've worked extremely hard on this. Out of the 1,400, um, the basic criteria we've been applying in looking at those is um, did this, if, if, the, if the service member uh, fulfilled their, their service commitment and there's no obvious reason to believe that, that, that they knew or should have known that they, there was an erroneous payment, then, we've not, then, then we don't need further review. We'll get rid of that case. Um, we, we, we think we can get rid of about half of the cases on that basis. So half of the 1,400, uh, we would expect to be notifying the soldiers that, that they're being relieved of any debt. And if they've already paid back, the, then, then we, uh, if they've already been subject to recoupment, that we'll reimburse their funds. The 16,000 cases, because debt hasn't been established, we have broader discretion. Um, and so we're looking at a, at a broader category of factors. So older debts, smaller debts, um, cases with people who are junior in rank who wouldn't necessarily be expected to know of eligibility, things like that. We're just, we're not pursuing those cases at all. So of the 16th and of the 16,000, we go through a, we're going through a screening process that will elim eliminate about 15,000 of the cases off the top. We'll then put those cases, the remaining cases, the remaining thousand or so cases, 1,500,000 cases, through the same kind of screening process that we put the the, uh, the cases in which a debt uh, has been established, and uh, to determine um, so that so that only those cases in which the soldier soldier didn't fulfill their commitment or there's reason to believe that, that, that there was that was fraud or knowledge on the part, part of the soldier will go before a, a, a BCMR. So we, we expect to get rid of at least 15,000 of those 16,000 cases, probably more than that, and to be notifying soldiers, in, uh, again, beginning in the next month, um, that they will not be subject to, debt, to any debt collection. The bottom line is, as I said, uh, we expect a few hundred cases, several hundred cases, uh, but uh, in all likelihood fewer than 1,000 to go before the boards for correction of military records. And in each of those cases, then, the soldier will have an opportunity to present their case and argue that um, even, even though there's enough to put it before a BCMR, there isn't enough to justify debt collection and that should be forgiven. Um, so we're well along in that process. We've established the process as, as, as the Secretary directed. Uh, we think that uh, we, have, we have the BCMR staffed up. They're prepared to hear the cases. Uh, they have st sufficient staffing to hear all the cases that we'll be presenting to them and to do that by the July deadline established by the Secretary. We think it, that, that the number of cases in which we'll be recouping will be a few hundred as opposed to the many thousands of cases that are under, under, under the sword of Damocles, as I said, right now, and that most of the cases in which we'll be recouping will actually be cases in which the soldiers did not fulfill their commitment. There'll be some cases in which we have fraud or evidence of fraud or knowledge or uh, should, have, should have known, um, but most of the cases in which we'll be recouping, we'll be, we will be recouping because the soldier didn't fulfill their com commitment. 
Um, there's been some interest in other states and whether other states are in the same position as California. We've reviewed audits that were done contemporaneously. We've reviewed a review that uh, there was a review conducted by the National Guard Bureau back in 2011. We've looked at all those. We've looked at the follow-up from those, and we've determined that that there was no other state in which um, there was the kind of, of of massive problem that there was in California. Um, where there are, as I said, 17,500 cases that were identified by the California National Guard for potential debt collection. Uh, we don't see more than a few dozen cases in any other state where we've had recoupment from this, from, from this kind of thing. Um, we believe that the National Guard Bureau and the Army have corrected the lack of internal controls that led to this problem uh, in the first place, and uh, we are very hopeful that we will not have any kind of similar problem going forward. So the bottom line is we think we've met the Secretary's goal of rapid equitable treatment for our soldiers and that we have in place a process that will protect the taxpayers um, but will also be fair to our soldiers uh, in terms of collecting debts. So with that, if there are any questions. Um, uh, did I understand you correctly that the number of cases that then will be heard by the Board for Correction of Military Records total would be? Several hundred. Several hundred, and they would be finished by July, is that the plan? That's the plan, yes. We have the BCMR staff so that they can finish that, those several hundred cases by July. Other questions for Peter? I haven't followed this issue at all, but the thing you made the point here that the lack of internal controls in California led to a lot of this. What was, and you you have a background in management. You're back. What was some of the major issues with the internal controls? There, were, that there was relevant? a lack of there was a lack of, of internal controls in the bonus in the bonus system nationwide. There was an ability for a single person to sign off on the bonus and be the be the approval authority and the review authority. And um, there was there was not there were not automated checks built into the system into the system. So we've since automated it. We've required separate a separate review cycle so that so that you don't have a one person sign off, but you have a separate review. So we think we've addressed the the obviously the obvious internal control problems that that led to this. Those internal control problems weren't unique to California. What was unique to California was that we had somebody who was convicted of fraud, um, and we had we had. Uh, there are two things that, that internal, contr internal control leads to a vulnerability. Then the question is, did somebody exploit the vulnerability? What we had in California was the vulnerability was systematically exploited. That's why we had the problem there that we didn't have elsewhere. By corrupt individuals. Well, we had, we had individuals who've been, who've been uh, convicted of fraud and have been disciplined, yes. The definition of corrupt individuals. Yeah. Yes, Louis. Um, sir, how do you, the NDA language I think uh, contains language that uh, I think gave an across the board uh, for giving. Uh, the NDAA language required us to to conduct a case by case review of all these cases. Um, so we are already conducting that review. We believe that our review is consistent with the requirements of that language. But it, it does not say it's across the board forgiveness. It requires us to look at, each, at individual cases. It does establish a standard which is, which is very favorable to the soldiers, um, but we were planning to lean in favor of, of soldiers when in doubt in any case. I think the NDA also had language that um, for Fixing the credit reports of individuals uh, who yeah. So with. when we forgive a debt, one of the things that we do, this is DFAS is our central debt collection agency, and when they forgive a debt, they they are they would notify the, uh, the uh, credit agencies automatically. That's part of their process. So that is something that that the bill requires us to do, that we will do. Uh, I believe the bill also asks us to do to do to take steps if we can to adjust secondary effects. Um, you know, somebody who lost their mortgage or something. There's very little. There may be little that we can do in those cases, but we'll look at those and see if there's something. If, if if somebody comes to us and says that they that there was some secondary effect that that to their detriment, we'll look at it and see if there's something we could do. And do you have an initial estimate on the cost of the reimbursements right now? Um, the the cost of the taxpayer is going to be minimal. It'll be. I think the total amount of recoupment in these cases was 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 uh, a few million dollars. I think on the maybe may, maybe as much as ten million dollars, but but very little of that had been collected. So the the exposure to the, t to the taxpayer is pretty minimal out of a of a military personnel budget of tens of billions of dollars. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Now, before I take your questions on other topics, I did want to uh, 
update a few things uh, with regard to the counter ISIL fight. And first of all, I wanted to extend uh, offer condolences on behalf of Secretary Carter and all of us here at the Department of Defense to the people of Turkey, and especially those affected by the cowardly attack in Istanbul on New Year's Eve, as well as to the people of Baghdad affected by Monday's bomb attack there and the recent terror attacks we've seen in that city. We have known for some time that as ISIL loses ground in Iraq and Syria, that it will continue to try and carry out high-profile attacks on innocent civilians. Those attacks will not deflect us from our efforts, and those efforts continue to bear fruit. Iraqi officials report that two-thirds of East Mosul is now in government hands, and the resumption of offensive operations since December 29th has resulted in steady progress against ISIL in Mosul. The various axes of advance into the city have begun to link their fronts, which improves the ability of Iraqi forces to support one another and reduces ISIL's ability to cope with continuous pressure. The coalition continues to provide critical support to the efforts, uh, especially from the air. Meanwhile, in Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces are also seeing significant results against ISIL in the drive towards Raqqa. Key ISIL-held terrain near Tabqa is now under increasing pressure. In all, they have captured more than 2,000 square kilometers of territory since their isolation operations began. And that pressure will continue to build as we accelerate efforts on all these fronts, preventing ISIL from terrorizing those suffering under its so-called caliphate in Iraq and Syria and reducing its ability to spread terror outside of its so-called borders. And with that, happy to take your questions. Back to Bob. Peter, um, Kim Jong-un says that they're getting close to having a ballistic missile of intercontinental range. And my question is, what is the Defense Department's policy at the moment if North Korea were to test launch a missile of intercontinental range, would the Defense Department attempt to shoot it down? Well, first of all, Bob, as you know, Multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions explicitly prohibit North Korea's launches using ballistic missile technology or further development of a ballistic missile program. And we call on all states to use every channel, available channel, means of influence to make clear to the uh, to North Korea and its enablers that launches using ballistic missile technology or efforts to advance North Korea's ballistic missile capabilities are unacceptable. We further call on all states uh, to take steps to show that there are consequences to the DPRK's unlawful conduct. And we call on the DPRK to refrain from provocative actions and to make the strategic choice to fulfill its international obligations and commitments and return to serious talks. And we reaffirm our ironclad commitments to defend our allies utilizing the full spectrum of U.S. extended deterrence uh, capabilities. Um, Bob, these resolutions explicitly prohibit North Korea uh, from engaging in ballistic missile tests and from developing this technology. And uh, we would once again call on the North Koreans to refrain from provocative actions. And I'm not going to hypothesize on what could happen in the future, but uh, we remain confident in our uh, ballistic missile defense uh, and in our defense of our allies and our defense of the homeland. So you're saying there is no stated explicit policy of contesting a test launch by shooting it down? We remain confident in our ability to protect the homeland, and I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. On what yeah. Bob was asking, have you seen any evidence that North Korea is preparing for an ICBM launch? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into intelligence matters at this point. Um, once again, there are ample reasons why North Korea should not carry out something of a provocative nature. We've said that explicitly before, and we'll say it again. Uh, there are UN resolutions. The international community has called on North Korea not to do these kinds of things, and I'm not going to get into intelligence matters, but obviously they've talked about developing this capability, uh, and it's something we're watching very carefully. Has the U.S. delivered this message to North Korea in the last 24 hours? We have delivered that message uh, consistently for uh, weeks, months, and years, and I'm doing so again today. Idris. Um, one of the sort of things the U.S. is doing is placing the THAAD missile system in South Korea. Does this latest announcement um, make it more Sir, does the timeline need to be closer? Because I believe it's eight to ten months right now. So is there an effort to relook really at moving that? Um, we are towards? working closely, Idris, as you know, with the South Koreans to uh, install and, and deploy that system as quickly and efficiently as possible, and we'll do everything we can working with the South Koreans to do that. Uh, we think it's an important part of our broader uh, missile defense uh, efforts uh, in support of our, our ally uh, and in support of the region as well. You know, this counterparts in Japan and South Korea after Kim Jong-un's latest? Uh, I don't have any calls to read out for you. Jamie. 
What is the state of the U.S. ballistic missile defenses right now? Is the United States in a position to shoot down an incoming uh, intercontinental ballistic missile if it's perceived as a threat to the U.S. homeland? Do we have uh, interceptors and systems that are, are up and capable of, of carrying out that mission? What's the state of our missile defenses? Well, you know, uh, Jamie, that this is a system, this is an effort that we've been very active on. Secretary Carter's been very active on for, uh, for some time. And uh, there are layers in terms of our ballistic missile defense. Uh, there are various aspects to it. And that comprehensive uh, uh, defensive system we feel very confident in. And there are aspects to it, again. Uh, we mentioned the THAAD system. We, uh, obviously, you're aware of our Aegis systems. You're aware of the TP2 radars we have in the region and also our, our, our ground-based system. And uh, this is a, a system that we uh, continue to work on, continue to develop, but we're confident in our ability to protect the homeland. But does that ground-based system, the interceptors that are based in Alaska, does, is it, um, has it had, does it have the capability at this point of, of, of shooting down an incoming missile? I'm not going to discuss our capabilities, but we're confident that we're in our ability to protect the homeland. Tony. I've asked you this before, but the last successful intercept test was in June of 2014. What is the schedule for the next ground-based intercept test? Those are the missiles that would knock down an ICBM, not that or Aegis, you know that. What's, what's the schedule going forward? Uh, Tony, I'm not sure of the exact test schedule right in front of me. We can take that question if you want. But again, this is part of our, our overall system, um, and we feel confident in our ability to protect the homeland. I'll state that again. This is a system that uh, we continue to work on, continue to develop, and uh, uh, this has uh, been an area of significant focus for the department, certainly for Secretary Carter and his career here uh, at, the, at the department, and one we'll continue to, to work on. But uh, this is a system that is in place right now, and uh, given all the aspects of our broader uh, missile defense system, our layered system, uh, we feel confident in our ability to, to deter this threat and protect uh, American citizens. Even if you haven't had a test since June of 2014, why are you so confident, if you haven't had a test since then, that it would work? I mean, it did work, it did work then. There was two failures prior to that. But what's the basis of the confidence, you know, in general? Because we are not relying on any one thing uh, to protect the United States. And protect the United States we have, Korea. Tony, I'm just... I'm not going to get into uh, details here about, uh, about our broader system, other than to say that we have a layered defense and we are confident in our ability to protect American citizens. Barbara. So none of this is actually hypothetical on the part of North Korea because they're already publicly shown they're working on all of these components. Big picture, how seriously does the U.S. military take, take Kim Jong-un's statement that he will uh, deploy an ICBM? How seriously do you take this? It's not hypothetical. Well, again, Barbara, this is something they've been talking about for some time. We've talked at, at length about our willingness, our, our ability to, to deter this uh, threat, and more significantly, that we have to take it seriously, that the fact that they're trying to develop this. And so that's what we're doing. And you've heard multiple testimony on that front for, for senior leaders, from senior leaders for this building for, for years. And you have talked a lot about deterrence, but also not hypothetical because it's well known. What is the capability of the United States military to engage in preemptive action? This has been contemplated before. The weapons that you have to do this are public knowledge weapons, but you're only talking deterrence. Would the United States take out a North Korean capability in a preemptive fashion, or is the, or is the military strategy only deterrence? Barbara, I'm not going to talk about uh, hypothetical situations. I'm not going to talk about uh, potential military action. I'm going to talk about what we have in place, our commitment to our South Korean allies, and our, uh, again, vigilance on this issue against uh, a provocative country that has shown disregard to the international community for its international obligations. And uh, we're watching this very, very carefully. And I'd like to come back to Tony's question very quickly. Mm -hmm. With a 50 percent success rate 
in your ground-based interceptors at Fort Greeley in California at best. That's the last line of defense before something would hit the United States. So that is the most important. Why are you so confident with something like a 50% success rate and no test in the last two years? I will repeat what I just said to, to Tony. We have uh, a ballistic missile defense, uh, a missile defense umbrella that we're confident in for the region and to protect the United States homeland, and we'll continue to be confident in it. Uh, given uh, where we are today and the technology and uh, the skill with which our forces are using the, that technology. Lucas. Peter, these UN resolutions did not, <clears throat> did not stop North Korea from testing two nuclear devices last year, nor did they stop North Korea from conducting dozens of short and intermediate range ballistic missile tests. Why should anything change now? Uh, Lucas, this is once again, the international community is uh, uniformly challenging North Korea to uh, once again not carry out provocative actions. This is, uh, this is a, a country that uh, has demonstrated a, uh, an unwillingness to be part of the international community. And we're once again calling on all players, uh, all countries, to use what influence they have to get North Korea not to, uh, not to engage in these kind of provocative actions. And uh, so it Again, this is, this is something that uh, the United States has spoken out forcefully on and other countries have as well. Does Secretary Carter believe that strategic patience was successful when dealing with North Korea? Listen, North Korea continues to be a, a threat to this country. You've heard Secretary Carter talk about that at length. It's one of the five uh, uh, challenges that we're dealing with on a daily basis, and it's the reason we have more than 28,000 troops in South Korea right now ready to fight tonight. Uh, this is a country that's clearly shown a, a willingness to threaten the United States, threaten our allies in the region, and we're going to continue to do everything we need to to protect ourselves from that threat. Laurent. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to know how you qualify the, uh, the policy of the U.S. Uh, DOD um, since it has become clear that uh, North Korea is getting clearer and clearer to having a ballistic missile. Would you say, for instance, that uh, you have increased planning or that there are more and more people working on scenarios uh, on North Korea? We are, Laurent, uh, dealing with North Korea, this has been a, a recurring challenge for us and one we don't lose sight of every single day. Uh, and we're constantly adjusting to the threat North Korea uh, poses and whether it's, uh, again, their development of an ICBM capability, which is something they've talked about. Uh, that's obviously something they're trying to do it. They say they're trying to do it. So accordingly, we are adjusting uh, uh, accordingly to that threat. So it's a bit business as usual. It's business as usual every day for the Department of Defense to be ready to respond to the challenges and threats facing the United States, and North Korea is one of them. Yes, Ali. Uh, thank you. Um, do you agree with President-elect's uh, view that China is not doing nothing on North Korea issue? Uh, listen, I'm not going to comment on the president-elect's views on this. I can speak to uh, uh, what I said previously, that uh, the United States uh, feels that there are a number of countries, uh, calls on all countries, to use the influence they have to encourage North Korea not to engage in provocative actions and to use whatever influence they have to get them uh, to try and join the international community and, and not threaten their neighbors in the region and, and beyond. Uh, and uh, so, again, we encourage every country that has an ability to, to influence North Korea to do that. Secretary, the NDA passed in December mm -hmm. 6, uh, asked Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State to take steps to declare India as a major defense partner. This was already announced by the White House when Prime Minister came in uh, here. But what steps Secretary intends to take now or, or advise his successor to take steps to, for this? Well, you know, the Secretary was in India not long ago where the uh, next steps in that process uh, took place uh, with Minister Parikar. Uh, and so the Secretary's commitment to this is clear. We think uh, the defense relationship uh, with India is on an excellent path and will continu continue to be so uh, in the next administration and beyond. There are critiques of this uh, legislative process with which they say this means nothing unless there are changes in export control laws of the U.S., uh, which will 
help India acquire latest equipments and technologies, defense equipment technologies from the U.S., which is not happening. There's no such move. Listen, our relationship with India, uh, you've seen the commitment made by this department, this Secretary of Defense, and, and this uh, administration to uh, improving our defense relationship with, uh, with India, and that's uh, obviously there's several aspects to it. There are limits on what we can do in terms of technology, the export of technology to India or any other country, and we'll continue to abide by, by the law and to work with India in, in places where we can, where uh, 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 it's appropriate for that kind of technology, for specific technology to be exported, again, not just to India, but to, to any country. But we're going to follow the law. Yes, Jennifer. Hi, Peter. Um, at the end of last year, a senior uh, U.S. military official said that 50,000 ISIS fighters had been killed in the last few years by the U.S. military um, in Iraq and Syria. I'm trying to understand those numbers since the the Pentagon and um, other intelligence agencies have always estimated that there were only 20 to 30,000 ISIS fighters when the fight started and even in subsequent months. So where do you get this 50,000 figure and can you walk us through uh, that number? Yeah, we, we've had that question a couple times. And first of all, uh, again, a, a, a senior Defense Department official um, provided you that number, which that was their prerogative to do. It's not a number that we uh, talk about publicly because it's a it's not a good metric of success and it's not an easy number to to determine for all the reasons you would think about uh, this is a war zone this is a conflict uh, much of our efforts are being conducted from the air we don't necessarily have the ability to uh, assess everything on the ground in the way we might like and uh, so there have been a variety of, of estimates I know the Iraqis have had some estimates as well um, and so I, I, there isn't a, a good number for us to, to share with you because we don't have great confidence in that number. Okay, so you would dispute that number perhaps? Uh, I don't know if it's right or wrong. Yes. Has the U.S. coalition or U.S. aircraft supported Turkish operations in Al Bab recently? Um, my understanding is that uh, last week there was uh, a request um, when some Turkish forces came under fire for uh, for. Uh, air support, and there was uh, there were flights conducted by the coalition at that time. But uh, we continue to talk, uh, Kasim, as you know, on a daily basis with our Turkish colleagues about uh, their operations in Al Bab and the serious fight and the serious effort that the Turkish uh, forces there and the and the uh, uh, Syrian forces there being supported by uh, the government of Turkey are engaged in and the important fight that they have against ISIL uh, in that area. You, you mentioned as a, as a uh, you mentioned it as a flight rather than a some kind of strike, mm -hmm. and we haven't seen any kind of strikes around Al Bab from the coalition daily releases. So is it just come some kind of a sorties that you conducted down there, or did these, these aircraft uh, yeah. conduct any air strikes? Uh, uh, my understanding that was uh, there was not a strike specifically, but there were aircraft. Um, involved in that effort, a visible show of force, if you will, uh, by coalition aircraft. And we continue uh, to talk with uh, the government of Turkey uh, about the appropriate level of support uh, for the efforts there in Al-Bab, and that's uh, an ongoing conversation, conversations even happening uh, today. What's the point of talking with, between Turkey and the U.S. in that? Because we are coordinating carefully our effort against uh, ISIL. Uh, our comprehensive effort against ISIL. We want to continue to apply pressure on ISIL on as many fronts as possible, uh, and we're trying to do that in the most uh, efficient and effective way possible. Uh, we're trying to deconflict uh, issues in, in the area as well, as you know, uh, and uh, so we'll continue to have that conversation. And we uh, see the very significant efforts that the Turkish military is engaging in in Syria, the sacrifice of Turkish forces in Syria, the significant sacrifices, and uh, obviously uh, supportive of everything they're doing to try and take on ISIL, uh, and the coalition is as well. Yeah, but the thing that I'm not understanding is this. I don't understand is this. You know, when it, it was Jarablus, it was mm -hmm. others in other parts of Syria. Tabik, mm -hmm. the, the coalition support was unprecedented, and the talks didn't really last any kind of months. But mm -hmm. when it comes to El Bab, there is a certain reservation by the United States down in the, for this town, I believe, or is it correct? Because, you know, talks have been continuing for, for four weeks, and then 
uh, Turkey Turks in the end just co started to cooperate with Russians in the city against ISIS. So do you, uh, don't you think that it's a failure of the United States uh, just to keep partners together down in fight against ISIS in Syria? No, I don't. Uh, we continue to talk every day with our, our Turkish ally about uh, these issues, and we continue to coordinate very carefully with Turkey on these issues. And I'm not going to get into every private discussion that's happening there, but uh, uh, one of the reasons we're able to feel confident about what's going, uh, what's happening and what's going forward is because of that level of coordination at all levels uh, with the Turkish government, including military to military on the ground. And we'll continue to have those conversations. What's your reaction to the Turkish and Russian cooperation in al -Bab? Um, I'm not aware of specific Turkish-Russian cooperation in al -Bab, and I'll leave that to Turkey and Russia to speak to. First time the coalition in support of Turkey in Al Bab or near Al Bab? Um, I don't know if it's the first time. I'm just pointing the most. This happened last week, as I understand it. Did they request just overflight, or did they request that you drop ordinance? Uh, I don't know the exact details of it, but I know there was a request for support because of uh, forces under fire, and we responded to that. Are you now supporting Turkey in the Al Bab operation? Because I know previously you weren't. Uh, as I said, we are working every day, uh, including today. Um, with all of our partners uh, in Iraq and Syria with regard to the counter-ISIL effort. And that includes Turkey in Syria and their efforts, their substantial efforts against ISIL. And we're going to do that in the most productive and efficient way possible. And uh, we are going to expend every effort we can to make sure uh, that we're doing this in the most effective way possible. Yeah, Tony. Transition question. Uh, under the rules of the road, nominees to for head of department have to work with the general counsel's offices of the respective departments on their financial disclosure statements. Mm -hmm. Those st statements, once they're completed, go to the White House and then to the Office of Government Ethics. What is the status of General Mattis's discussions with the Pentagon Standards of Conduct Office in crafting his standard form 70, his disclosure form? Tony, I'm going to refer you to General Mattis and to the transition team for the for the Trump folks, that's a question for them to answer. No, it's a question that this, he has to work with the Pentagon, the General Counsel's Office, so it's a question for your operation. Well, if the submission comes from General Mattis and from the, the Trump folks. I think it's most appropriate for them to respond to whether or not he's provided any information. I, I don't know if he has or not. Well, can you check that? I mean, he comes here. The action is with the Pentagon. Have you checked with them? He gets, they get the form completed here, and then it goes to the Office of Government Ethics and then to the Senate. It's not the transition team that does it. Okay. Uh, I'll, we'll take the question, but I, again, I would just refer, defer to General Mattis, uh, and I would encourage you to, to reach out to them to see if they might be willing to answer your question more easily than I can. We tried. They said go to the Pentagon and try to ask them. Okay. So we'll take your question. Thank you. Okay. Yes, over here. Uh, I'm Andy DeGrom for the Military Times. Andy, Andy, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Um, uh, over the weekend, we reported that uh, a United States Marine was wounded in Iraq, and uh, I'm wondering if you can provide any additional details about the incident surrounding that. I, I can't. I'm sorry. Is that because you don't have them? I, or? I, I don't have the information. We, as you know, normally don't comment on, on uh, wounded service members, um, and uh, I, I wasn't aware even of your story. Uh, so it's uh, obviously concerned about any service member who's, uh, who's injured, but I don't have specific details to read out to you here. Can you talk about what the Marines, uh, sp specifically Marine Raiders, are doing in Iraq at this point? Um, I, I know that we have uh, uh, a number of forces in Iraq, as you know, range of forces, including uh, special operations forces, and uh, they're performing a range of, of things as part of the train, advise, and assist mission. And I'm not going to get into specific uh, disposition of our uh, particularly our Special Operations Forces, but they're all doing significant work on behalf of the Counter-ISIL Coalition and, uh, and uh, thank them, first of all, for their service and, and their sacrifice for what they're doing. Carlo. Yeah, Peter, I just wanted to follow up on Asim's question um, about al Bab. Mm -hmm. So if this is, in fact, the first time Coalition Air Support has been provided for the Turks in that area, what's changed? Because the operation's been going on for a while now, and I know Colonel Dorian and others from OIR have made the explicit point that we are that the coalition is not involved at all with the Al Bab operation. So I'm just kind of curious, where was the? I think it reflects uh, reflects part of our ongoing conversation with uh, with Turkey, uh, and uh, again the coalition's focus on ISIL and trying to make sure that we're keeping as much pressure on ISIL uh, 
uh, as we can. And uh, certainly, the Syrian forces that are there, the, the uh, opposition forces that are there, and uh, with the support of the Turkish military, are, are carrying out a significant effort against ISIL. And uh, we think that's a good thing. And, uh, but we're trying to coordinate uh, support in the best way possible, and that's part of a, the give and take that's going on with uh, Turkey right now. You said the discussions are even going on today about, you know, further they're, they're happening every day. We have people on the ground working uh, these issues. Understood. Now, are these conversations designed to just sort of maintain the status quo as far as the relationship between Turkish forces and OIR, or is the, or is this Al-Bab sort of development kind of, you know, driving towards a more, like an evolution of these talks, leading to possibly joint coordinate or joint operations We've worked integration. jointly, as you know. Uh, with Turkey in Syria. Uh, they're a member of the coalition, a critical member of the coalition, and we will continue to work closely with, uh, with Turkey. We're trying to uh, uh, deal with this situation in the most efficient way possible to keep multiple pressure on, on ISIL and to do this in an efficient fashion. And uh, again, I'm not going to get into every single discussion we're having with our, with our Turkish ally, but these are extensive conversations at the highest levels, uh, and also, uh, obviously, even on the ground, military to military. So is the goal then to get Turkey involved in the coalition? The goal is to defeat ISIL, and uh, it is a goal that we and Turkey share. And uh, in light of uh, uh, ISIL's claim uh, to be responsible for the terror attack on New Year's Eve in Turkey, you can see all the more reason why Turkey has a significant interest in this, why we would like to do everything we can to help Turkey in that effort, and the coalition would as well. Uh, this is about not only uh, ejecting ISIL from Syria and Iraq. It's about protecting our homelands, uh, and that includes Turkey, and that includes the United States. Barbara. I would like to follow up on the gentleman's question from Military Times on wounded. You have consistently said from the podium that you do not discuss those wounded in action, but of course, uh, that's, all due respect, that's not exactly true for the administration. The White House, point number one, has publicly acknowledged when the president goes to the hospitals to visit recently wounded members. You have a website that posts wounded in action that your own staff says is not regularly updated. So, in the last couple of, couple of weeks before this secretary leaves office, I want to ask again if you wouldn't find a way to provide an accurate number of U.S. service members wounded in action in Syria and Iraq in the fight against ISIS. We provide we, that update now. The, your own we, staff says that is not. We provide that update now. There are privacy issues, Barbara, and I'm going to. Our policy has been set, and we're going to stick with uh, with our policy. And we we provide that number. Uh, we update that number on a regular basis. Well, I think that's probably not a very regular basis. So I'm asking. That's fine. I'm asking now for an updated number of the number of Amer <coughs> American service members wounded in Iraq and Syria. I would like an updated number reflecting the case that this gentleman is talking about, the most up-to-date information you have. I will, because I will you check with our team, with OIR and CENTCOM, and we will provide you the updated number. You say you don't acknowledge the wounded, but then, of course, there's all these ways in which you uh, I'm do. I'm not talking about a specific instance. There are no. privacy issues here. Not violating anyone's privacy issue. Mm -hmm. I am asking you. You say you don't acknowledge the wounded. We do acknowledge it, Barbara. We acknowledge it with an updated number that we provide, and we will provide you that number. Well, let's have a, a absolutely up-to-date number, if you wouldn't mind. The other thing I wanted to ask you: Can you take the question about this Turkish, um, the the mission to protect the Turkish forces? You said that U.S. forces did respond. Can you please take the question, did they in fact drop ordinance? My um, understanding is, uh, uh, from what I understand, that they did not drop ordinance in this instance. Uh, it was a show of force in response to uh, forces coming under fire. And my last question is, is it correct, can you clarify, is it correct, have U.S. forces now in, at various points entered the city limits of Mosul? Yeah, I know this is a question you've had. Uh, previously, others have as well. We're not going to talk about the disposition of U.S. forces uh, in and around Mosul specifically for understandable reasons, Barbara, uh, because we don't want to give the enemy any more 
of an ability to understand where our people might be. And so said in the past that it is up to General Townsend to actually is. make that decision. It is. It, as, the, as the forward line of troops uh, moves, U.S. forces and coalition forces will adjust as well. But I'm not going to tell you where they are at this particular moment in time. I'm asking where they are at this particular time. I mm -hmm. am asking whether or not there has been reason for them at any point to enter the city limits. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't want to give our enemy any idea where those forces might be at any particular moment in time, whether it's today, yesterday, or in the future. And you said on North Korea that you were uh, the U.S. is adjusting. That was your word to the ballistic missile threat. So I just want to close that loop. Is there anything you're willing to say about how you are adjusting to the recent ballistic missile threat by North Korea? We continue to engage on a daily basis with our allies in the region. We are taking steps to bolster our uh, defensive systems in the region. We discussed, for example, the deployment of the THAAD system to South Korea. Uh, we've taken steps to bolster our Aegis presence in the region. We have, uh, we mentioned before, the radar systems that are now in place and our efforts as well with uh, the ground-based system to update and advance those in addition. We have 28,500 troops in South Korea right now uh, on, uh, prepared uh, to respond to the North Korea threat. And we are constantly looking at the threat North Korea uh, poses to the United States and to our allies in the region and uh, are always prepared to respond accordingly. This is an assessment that happens, uh, as you know, um, on a practically a daily basis. We have to be ready to respond to North Korea, given its history, given its provocative actions in the past, and we are prepared to do so. Ryan. Uh, given this provocative action by North Korea, as you put it, um, are you, would you call on China to drop its opposition to the THAAD system? Um, there's, we have said from here, and I, I believe our South Korean allies have as well, that uh, there's no reason for China to oppose that system. This is a defensive system, uh, and uh, there's no reason for anyone in the region to have concern about that, uh, other than perhaps North Korea, because this is a system that is uh, part of our broader umbrella, our defensive umbrella, uh, and uh, we think an important step in bolstering the defense of our ally and, in fact, enhancing security in the, in the region overall. Um, and so, again, we don't see any reason for any country to have a problem with that deployment except perhaps North Korea. And just on, on the Al-Bab thing, just generally, are there any U.S. forces <coughs> embedded with Turkish units right now in Syria? I'm not going to talk about uh, our, our forces right now in Syria. So, yes, I've been patiently waiting in the middle. Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, on South China Sea issues, so do you have any readouts on the uh, USS Carl Vinson deploying to the South China Sea later this week? Um, I don't have anything for you on that. I can take that question. I'm not sure if the Navy's had something to say on that uh, specifically. So not any other uh, information that you can share with us? I, I don't have any up here, but I'll take that question if you'd like. So do you have any comments on the uh, ongoing? And I, I would just say broadly that we have uh, a presence in the South China Sea and the Asia Pacific, a uh, significant presence at all times, uh, and it would not be unusual for us to have an aircraft carrier or any other uh, uh, kind of ship in, in that part of the world. As you know, we have, have them deployed in many places in the, in the Asia Pacific, including in the South China Sea, and we will continue to do so. We've done so for decades. Yes? Uh, do you have any concern about the countermeasures from China, about the deployment of that in the, like, a few months later? Um, as I just mentioned, we the THAAD system is a defensive system that we've worked closely with the South Koreans uh, to find a suitable location for it. Um, we believe this is important to the defense of South Korea and to promote security in the region. It, uh, as we've explained uh, publicly, um, that China's concerns with it, we feel, are misplaced given that this is a defensive system. So we would, again, uh, encourage China to, to, to look at this system carefully and to, to see what we've been making clear for some time, that this is a defensive system and that there's no need for them to have concerns about this system. So you don't have any concern about the countermeasure from China, right? Uh, we, again, this is uh, something that will, uh, we think this deployment is important for the safety and security of South Korea and for our alliance relationship. And uh, we will continue to, uh, to work closely with the South Koreans to address any issues with regard to that. Discussion between U.S. and China during the transitional period. Um, I mean, the 
cooperation in military areas? Uh, I will leave it to the transition folks to discuss any conversations they may be having with the Chinese. So, yes, Joe. Yeah. I don't know if you have more information uh, you could share it with us in regards to a, a coalition airstrike that took place today in Idlib province. Uh, local reports are saying that more than 25 leaders from Nusra Front were killed in the airstrike. Joe, I don't have any more information for you on that on that airstrike. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm hearing from you about this airstrike, so. Lucas, you left and come back. Uh, Hot off the teletype there? That's right. I'm just going to read this. There's a seconds old tweet from President elect Donald Trump saying, quote, there should be no further releases from Gitmo. These are extremely dangerous people and should not be allowed back onto the battlefield. I was wondering what your reaction is to that. As we as I discussed previously here, we're going to carry out um, the appropriate policies as set forth by uh, the Commander-in-Chief with regard to Guantanamo Bay and the Secretary of Defense and his carrying out his responsibilities as Secretary of Defense, his unique responsibilities with regard to the review uh, of uh, people who have been previously determined to be eligible for release. Uh, and he's going to continue to carry out his responsibilities as appropriate uh, until he's finished as Secretary of Defense. Knowing the future Commander-in-Chief does not want some of these folks released. There's one Commander-in-Chief at a time. And the Secretary of Defense will continue to carry out his responsibilities as he sees uh, appropriate. All right. Louis, and I'll come back to the front, then we'll be done. So, uh, based on the discussion we had earlier about the yeah. North Korean ICBM capability, mm -hmm. North Korea has already conducted two long range satellite um, attempts uh, that show their missile capability. What, um, what would show their ICBM capability? Can you explain to us? What is the concern there? Louis, I'm not going to get into discussing their potential capabilities in the future. We will, they shouldn't be conducting ballistic missile testing of any kind, given uh, the resolutions uh, in the United Nations. Um, the international community has called on them not to do this, and we are doing so again. Uh, we think their development of ballistic missile technology is destabilizing. Uh, it does not promote uh, security in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula and in the region, uh, and we think it's harmful. And we will make that point again and again. And we will, in the meantime, be prepared to respond to, to North Korea uh, and be prepared to, to bolster our allies in the region uh, in their own uh, uh, desire to make sure that uh, it is as st safe and stable as possible in that part of the world. Technologically speaking, um, just as a matter of definition, is there something different uh, in, in, with regards to an quote ICBM test versus a long-range satellite test? What, what is what is different about it? What makes it an ICBM test? Just just as a matter of definition. Uh, I'm not going to parse technical definitions here, uh, Louis. For you again, this is uh, whether it's uh, those previous launches or any new tests that they conduct. Uh, it's in violation of UN resolutions, and it would be provocative and counterproductive. And we once again call them not to uh, engage in that kind of activity. And we're not the only ones. There are plenty of other countries in the world uh, telling them exactly the same thing. Since last week uh, you were up here, uh, Secretary President Donald Trump has tweeted twice about the F-35, the Pentagon's largest program. Mm -hmm. First he said costs are out of control, and then he asked Boeing to come up with a competitor version of the uh, F-18. General Biden, the, J the Joint Program Office Director a couple weeks ago, said the film costs are not under control, but what is, the de what is the DOD's current view of the program? We expect Biden to say costs are not under control, but what's the DOD's uh, view? This is, a, Tony, as you know, a critical program uh, to the defense of the United States. This is a program that multiple services are counting on for the future. This is uh, the first, fifth generation of uh, a fighter, and we think it's a critically important program um, that has had its problems in the past. Secretary Carter has spoken to that uh, in the past and has been one of those most responsible for getting it back uh, and working, running in the right direction. And uh, so we're confident in the capabilities of the F-35. And uh, again, as, have, as others have spoken to, this is a, an aircraft that, uh, that the services are counting on. Uh, not just the United States is counting on, but other countries as well. Final question here, unless uh, signing others. 
Uh, you mentioned in the statement previously that there will be an, an investigation on the USS underwater drone. Uh, on that. Do you have any update on that? Uh, I don't have an update for you. I, I, my understanding is the uh, analysis and assessment is ongoing. Um, and uh, so I don't have anything more beyond that. Has it been returned? Yes. Is there any further talking with the... You must the have been on vacation. For that. I was. So. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any further talking between the U.S. and Chinese Navy on that um, issue? I don't have anything to read out to you uh, specifically on that topic. So... Gitmo. How many transfers can the American public expect before uh, January 20th? Uh, I, you can expect, uh, uh, Lucas, that, uh, again, the department will carry out its obligations uh, under law, all the legal requirements involved, and it will carry out those um, as the Secretary of Defense uh, deems appropriate between now and the end of his term. I, I don't have a number for you. 18, 20? I don't have any number for you. Those uh, will happen. Uh, there's a p protocol and procedure for each and every one of those that we will follow to the letter. Uh, and, uh, and that is no different than how we've been operating since Secretary Carter first took this job. Okay, one more over here. Um, the NDAA uh, authorizes a military pay raise of 2.1%, which is about a half a percentage point above what the Pentagon had asked for. Um, and it's, I think it's bringing military pay increases in line with the private sector for the first time in about five years. Uh, would you say that this signals an end to the era of austerity as it relates to military compensation that we've seen? Well, I've, uh, I'm not sure I'd characterize uh, austerity as the, the word I'd use, but obviously this is, it's important for our service members to, uh, uh, to be treated in an appropriate fashion and to be paid for their significant service to the country. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that uh, the president signed, uh, and, uh, and we feel it's important for compensation for all service members to be compensated appropriately within the restraints of the budget situation that, that we face as a country and as a government, and we continue to face uh, constraints going forward. Um, but it, it's appropriate for our service members to, to get a pay raise given their significant service.